Okay, the whole five hours. We're going. We're getting our five hour course in uh, Jocko and Echo's uh, kill box here, I guess. This is Jocko Podcast number three thirty two with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Psychological Good evening, Echo. Being. So when <laughs> I first started this podcast, when we first started the double this negative podcast, after you crumpled. And you still operate your different. way out. You're going to have to figure it out. Situations, how I handled different just, situations, what I thought about you look various like number, subjects, oh, man, that was too down. different Jeez. viewpoints I had concerning <laughs> yes. leadership. And and it's like, really you can rip those things down. Nature. Like I said, it's still and high and low. Almost immediately do started I do getting it? Do I not feedback do it? and started getting asked questions. And people do that. would say, hey, of it. Uh, have you studied stoicism? Or are you? did you do a lot of work? You know, looking at, at, at Nietzsche, or, or some other you gotta hit ancient somebody with the or modern school of philosophy. The Zen art of motorcycle repair for Nietzsche. And, and the short answer was that, no, I, I didn't. Somebody in the mill I, I, I didn't do that. I mean, I left high school to the military, so there wasn't like this big back educational background for me. I'm not an academic of any kind. In fact, there was a, a funny... One of the earliest one live one events that I did. I still use to this day. And it was a relatively cultured audience out there and someone asked you know hey who's your favorite who's your favorite philosopher I like and i right said now. lemmy <laughs> and no one laughed like i laughed but no one else laughed and and so i added i said you know lemmy from from motorhead and a couple people sort of awkwardly laughed but not much and and later on we explored this idea a little bit more on the what podcast the, uh, and f1 because look f- there's much to be learned from tornado. old philosophers and, and old thinkers. And as it turns out, I agree with and I'm aligned with a lot of what they say. No, no doubt about it. I'm not trying to say anything negative about these ancient philosophers and the theories that they had. Superman's down. But the fact of the matter is I just didn't study them. I mean, like I said, I, I was a shitty high school student. I didn't. I don't think I read any books in high school. So... Yeah, I didn't learn anything about these yeah, things. I really didn't read until I was in jail. I just figured these things out through my own random trials and tribulations in life. And it was a similar situation with, with Jordan Peterson. When, when he came on the podcast for the first time, it was really obvious that we had come to many of the same conclusions in our views of life but he got to those conclusions through it's, uh, it's rigorous academic study can actually pull out and work as a clinical psychologist. Shark and shark I got shark there shark through my experiences in life right and in the teams. And I've been Institutional l- very lucky Whether in, in that military, regard. Psychology, very lucky to you can kind of stumble like, into things, like charges, be guided in if they don't have the certain number, situations, been shoved in some directions, in front, made goes, some good decisions along the way, made some bad decisions, and been lucky so enough to back, live through it and learn, learn from it. So I've been very, very lucky. But I also Here pay I'm attention to these kind of things. A lot of times I was paying attention to these kind of things because I I was trying to teach them. I originally started paying attention to leadership because I had to learn it in order to become a leader. So I was paying attention and I was watching what leaders were doing. And eventually I was paying attention to leadership because I was teaching it. And so I saw things and I stumbled into things. And... Uh, you know, one of the things I wrote about leadership strategy and tactics, I'm in my first platoon, we're, we're clearing gas oil platforms, I do a big write up about this in, in that book, but my platoon ends up on a skirmish line, we're all, we're all looking down our weapons, looking to engage targets, and no one's making a call, no one's making any kind of a decision, and I... As a new guy, I take a step back. Which means I broaden my field of view. John I look around so I can see more. And I, a nice finger. calm comes over me. And now I can go. see what we need to do. And I make a call. I and I started to teach that. I started to teach that to young leaders. Hey, you need to take a step back. You need to broaden your field of view. You need to look around. And it's really weird when you're And it's going to calm you down and allow you to make a decision. You, Mike. Fun, fun. I also would tell guys, hey, you need to take a breath. And I, I, I didn't have some, you know, I wasn't saying you need to take some spiritual transcendent breath. You need to reach deep into your inner soul and you breathe. I wasn't saying that. At the, at the, walls. the actual reason I was saying it was because you don't want to sound panicked when you come up on the radio. 
child. You don't want to come up on the radio and say, ah, we need to get everyone over this building. You don't want to do that. The ones that left. When were they you don't want to do it, number one, because everyone else is going to now panic, and number two, because everyone's going to make fun of you when you get back from this operation. So you don't want either one of these. So when you have to make a decision, you take a step back, and then you take a breath. See, you detach, there's a local you broaden your field of view, house, and these things will like calm you down right and now. allow you to make better in decisions. In your house, even though it's hard not to say he's a, and he's recently, be a lot of the pie charts. I've heard and some podcasts. Of push to help get the momentum. Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan, by the way, uh, they've had a guy on a couple times named Andrew Andrew Huberman. And gravity, okay. and this guy is a doctor, and so in your a house, neuroscientist, your house, a professor. What's and zenith, as I was listening to what he was saying, a, a lot of the things that I have been teaching were aligned with what he was saying. And, if probability and means believe it or not, I, I one of the things was like a broad field of vision like calms you down. Anyway. Taking a breath is something that scientifically calms you down, physiologically calms you down. Broadening your field of view physiologically calms you down. And guess what? I know this. The calmer you are, the better decisions you're going to make. Trouble. Then there were other things when I listened to him talk that I recognized from my own experiences. Cold water. It doesn't feel good when you get in it, but it feels good when you get done lifting weights, fasting, things that I had kind of instinctively or through trial and error figured out were now being reinforced XYZ, by someone that XYZ, XYZ, actually XYZ, academically understood Z, the science behind y, my X, instincts. Z, y, X, Z, y, X. Now, my instincts are not always right by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> I, I can, I should probably write an entire you went three litany of books about the dumb things i've done but i'm always looking to see hey if there's some things i'm doing right why are they right if there's things i'm doing wrong why are they wrong and always looking to increase the understanding that i have behind the things that i think i've figured out which is why we are fortunate to have very specific andrew huberman here with us tonight to help explain it's stupid and explore all you're gonna be doing is smash code. Like what you we can think. Smash your face but off we think we know what we think we think and how so we can get better at all it. of the above. Perfect. Andrew, and thanks for coming nothing, down, man. No it's good to meet you. No routes, Great to be here. Multiple phases Did that, steps uh, that you're gonna have when I was listening to you talk and I was hearing you talk about how about. You're, if you're focused on something small, it amps up your adrenaline. I was, I was listening. I was going, oh, it was all these things were coming creep. together. All these the dots creep. were getting connected. It's kind of crazy, it's right? Just... It's pretty wild. I mean, I think some people may know this. Creeps um, this many people creeps. probably won't. Was which is that your eyes are two pieces of your brain. They're the only two pieces of your brain. And yes, they are brain. For those of you that want to look it up, they're part of your central nervous system and they're outside your cranial vault. And they are there to set the aperture. I know it's hard because... Either tunnel vision or the broad field of view, not just on your vision, but on your thinking, which is what you described. And widening your field of view, your visual aperture, will allow you to parse more information it also changes your perception of time so the simplest way to put this is that when you are in a narrow field of view it's a bit like having a video camera in slow motion your frame rate is higher but in that small aperture you're Makes looking sense. at minor details as but soon as you hear it's, it's like, duh, of course so like but the opposite is also true I, I when do you brought in your field of view Photos. And that could be like, by literally you moving your head shops, around, give you but it can also just be like keeping your problems, head more or less stationary and problems, just deliberately broadening problems. your field of view. We call it panoramic vision. Now, in the classroom, you are the taking students, smaller frame rate, very small, or I should say, sorry, after, larger bins of time, this, you but the way the visual system works is really and clever. And it actually allows you to sense this motion more quickly. So when you run and catch a ball, or when you're walking along and you blink and a bee hits your eyelid, you didn't see it coming, qu- see it in quotes, the first but you were in that panoramic field of view, and your reaction second, time is four times e what it is one. when you're in that and narrow actually aperture. A bar where it's still, is now, that true? I, I, again, I just want to reiterate this and, and just clarify this. For like 20 years, yeah, I have been teaching young SEAL leaders and then was, you know other people in the world, in the business world, in the first responder world, in the military at large, 
For 20 years, I've been saying, hey, listen, when things start to get get wild, you need to get off your gun. You need to take a step back. You need to broaden your field of and view. I, you need the, to look around okay. to see what's happening. I've been so telling people that for 20 years, only because it just worked thing. for me. <laughs> and I luckily figured that out in my very first SEAL platoon. Right? And... And Those it took me a while to, to where I said, oh, that's something I need to tell other people to do. Like, I figured it out and would do it. But then once I was in a position where I was teaching these things, so that's just, like, wild that there's all these physiological things that occur that, for me, was I, I knew it. I knew that you better do this. Because, I mean, imagine, you want to talk about a field of view. Imagine what your field of view is like when you're staring down the, the barrel of your gun. Time, it's tiny. Your field of view is so focused. And equation. you don't so see anything. anything. I mean, other than the target right in front of you, X, you don't see anything. Right and that's what happens to reason, when, when a young SEAL is in a leadership position. That's what happens to them. They get, they, they're they looking down their weapon and they don't see anything that's happening. They can't make any decisions because they don't see the and entire picture they, they see nothing and so if i never that's kind of that crazy pattern, and that's uh, again that's these the are thing. just some of the and examples that i pulled from listening to you, you and right, listening to your podcast by the way huberman lab and error, what um, happen before we get down any up, more rabbit holes, a, let's let's Sarah talk about where you came from, how you ended up in this spot, because I would say you didn't take a sort of a standard route to end up where you ended up. So let's talk about young Andrew Huberman. What's going on? Where are you born? I got one where I was actually born in Stanford Hospital. Oh, okay. I joke. I you know I was born in Stanford Hospital. I trained at Stanford. I work at Stanford. I'll probably die at Stanford. Hopefully, a long time from now. You know, people say you're going to die in your office. There are worse places to die than uh, Stanford. Sure, um, how were you born there? Like, why? Yeah, so my your parents again, worked there. So my, my dad's from South America. He actually labor, came here. Um, he's a physicist, but he came like, here don't bring that up from take it up Argentina on a Navy scholarship. So the that's Navy paid for my dad to leave Argentina where there were no opportunities to do science. Of every came to the U.S., from went to University of Pennsylvania. Over the years, he's worked on various projects related to government. Check it off. I actually and don't know a ton about that, what he does now. Um, but growing up, uh, well, he met my mother in New York City. Anything else? And she's from the East Coast, time fraud from Jersey. Case. And, and my grandfather um, went to college on the GI Bill. To today, tomorrow, to maybe a little. And my mom, while he was in graduate school, on it, and she's running, he was a real physical guy. That would come up later. Okay. You know, your dad was. My grandma, my grandfather on my mom, okay, got it. So my dad, my mom met, moved to California. And had my it sister and I. Out. So and this was a time, I should say, when Palo Alto's, you know, no dot com, no Silicon Felix. Valley, it, in the scope of wealth Gravity in the Bay Area, we were down. we were middle like, class. Honor, we weren't a, a middle class. So we had single hand, single story home. I mean, we didn't we didn't want for things. Just you know, I didn't imagine be. about having Ferraris Nothing or anything. That we down. didn't. But there were kids in the other high school. There are two high schools in Palo Alto. I went to the one where all the nerdy kids went. It's actually called Gun High School, uh, G U N N. It has a funny reputation. Not funny. It has an infamous reputation. It's the highest suicide rate of any high school in the United States, for reasons that we can talk about. So, from the time I was born until about age thirteen, I had a pretty, I would say, kind of magical childhood. A bunch of young boys about my age lived down the street. Their Sometimes older sisters, they also have older sisters who were about my sister's age. And so it was biking lines. around and skateboarding around, playing baseball on the street, soccer, and swimming. Those are big sports in the Bay Area. The um, and we ate dinner together every night as a family. You know, we... I come, I come to great Florida life really and uh, this is so this is like this index, uh, until you're around 13 older. yeah until I was 13 and then, uh, and then my parents split up this was at a time in the 80s when I think there was only one other kid in school with divorced parents remember these times you right now it's you know, yeah. rampant but um, and unfortunately they didn't have the skills to handle it properly so just imagine the rule book of all the things parents aren't supposed to do in a divorce. <laughs> they, they basically systematically broke every one of those. My dad moved away. Um, and then Common Core is overseas for a bit. Come close with National and Guard in Mexico, I was at home with my mom, and, and she struggled York, with the fracture of our family in a major way. Them. This was right about really the time I hit puberty. And, so it's like throwing gasoline on fire. Down there right? And at the time, I was uh, a bit into skateboarding. Yeah. Um, this was early I days of the Bones Brigade and uh, we'll uh, animal chin videos. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, you can look it up and 